And that person, that guy was preparing was Samson. So that came to Samson's parents. This story, you find it in the book of Judges, from chapter 14 to chapter 16. So Samson's parents, we are told the name of the father. The father was Manoa. The mother's name is Marimeche. But the mother and the father were told by God, we are going to have a child. And because you are going to have a child, the mother of this child, beginning now, must be very careful. She must not drink wine or a strong drink. She must not any, eat anything unclean. For the child that is going to be born was going to be a special child that God has chosen for a special purpose. So, Samson's parents obeyed God. Everything that he said they, they were supposed to do concerning the child, they did until Samson was born. Samson was born and he grew up. Samson was a very strong man. How many of you have ever seen a strong man? Not, not from the cartoons. Let, let, let's talk from the Bible. Have you ever heard of a strong man in the Bible? Yeah. Yes. Who? Huh? Okay. Let me tell you some of them. One of the strong men that we read about in the Bible, there is one who is called Goliath. Have you ever heard of Goliath? The one that David killed and he chopped off his head and won victory for the Israelites. The other strong man was David himself. Do you know that David met a lion in a bay in the fields the first he was looking for after his father's sleep? And the, the lion and the bay would take a lamb and David would follow and grab that bay or that lion and slew it with his hands. David was very strong. But today we are talking of Samson. Samson was a very, very strong man. How do you know a strong man? A strong man is very... Yes! Yes, yes. A very strong man is very, sometimes is very tall in height. And sometimes he has got huge quantities of flesh around his body. Big muscles, triceps and biceps. Large quantities of flesh all around him. And when you look at him, you will be very much afraid. So Samson was very strong. One of the days when he was going to kill up like what he said, he met a lion. And the lion came against him, growling. Ah, ah. You know what Samson did? He didn't run away. He just grabbed that lion small. Like this. And he took it. Why open in the lion died? With his one hand. Then the other day, he was in Gaza. And the people of the land heard that Samson is in this area. They waited for him they, around the city. They wanted to catch him in the morning and kill him. Then he woke up at midnight. The city had, 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 had gates. You know the gate like that one? But it had what are called pillars. Pillars sometimes are made of steel or open. Sometimes they are round or square or rectangular in shape. But they are way up. They yes. support. They, they, they support the structures. And these pillars were supporting the king. Samson, because he was very strong, because the pillars are secured firmly to the ground, he just came and he grabbed the, the poles of the, the, those pillars of the king like this. And he uprooted the pillars and the gates and he carried them on his shoulders. Samson was very strong. So one of the days now, um, he married from the Philistines. And the Philistines found an opportunity to kill Samson. Then they sent their daughter and said, find out where Samson's strength comes from. You know where Samson's strength was coming from? It was coming from God, but he had to keep one secret. He had very, uh, he had a long hair. That long hair had never been shaven from the day he was born. More like a person who is going to trade. You know what trade? Trade. Like a raster. Raster, you know what raster is again? So Samson had a long head, which had never been shaved. And he was not supposed to shave that head or to tell anyone that his strength is because he has never been shaving ever since he was born. So the wife was bought by the uh, people and said, find out from your husband where his strength comes from. Because he's killing us every day. We want to catch him and kill him. Then she was pleading with Samuel every day. 
Yeah, so with Samsung, Samsung, tell me a secret of your strength. He lied, I think, about two times. He was telling him the wrong thing. He would go and tell the Philistines. They came out against him, and he would kill them because he still had his strength. Then one of the days, he, was, he ended up telling his wife the secret of his strength. And he told me that I had never been careful from the day that I was born till now. And this is where my strength lies. And you know what he did? She made him to lie on her lips. Then she brought someone and shamed Samson said, so that he had chisco, you know chisco, he bound him. Then he was told, Samson, the first night I told him, and Samson woke up thinking that it would be as always. But that day he was powerless. He was caught by the Philistines. They cracked off his ear with his eyes and he became blind. They took him to a place where they had a grinding mill. They tied him to that grinding mill and he was pulling that grinding mill all day. It was the way that a donkey was supposed to do. Then one of the days he then prayed to the Lord when they were making sport of him and they were in a hole and they were full in that hole. And he prayed with that, God, please forgive me for what I did, but I am kindly asking that you avenge me for my eyes on this people. Then he, with his might again, he pulled the pillars of what? Of that wall. And he killed more people than he had killed on his life, but he also died. Why did Samson die? If you will follow me, the story. Yes? So he was? Oh yes, because he had entered the hall. Samson died because he did not obey God. God told him that you must keep the secret of your strength to yourself. Don't tell anyone where your strength comes from. But because he was persuaded by his wife, he disclosed the secret and his hair was shaven and he died. You know, children, if we don't obey God, what follows? It may not follow immediately, but what follows eventually is death. If you want to live life, if you want to live long life, you must obey your parents, you must obey God. How will you Obedience will keep you protected. Obedience will keep you safe. Obedience will keep you in favor with God. So how many of you are saying you don't want to be like Samson, who betrayed the sacred trust? But we will want to obey when God says, don't do this, I will not do it. If he says, do this, I will do it. How many will want with God's way to start obeying God and to start obeying their parents? Really? Okay, let us pray. Our Father in heaven, what you take me this morning for the kids that have come to church today. They have heard the story of Samson and the adults have heard it again. We kindly request that you help us as we live on a day to day basis. Help us as your children to obey you in everything so that we may live long on this earth and that we may also find faith in us. Bless us now and always in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, kids. May God bless you. But always remember if you want to be safe, if you want to live long life, learn to trust God and to obey all the time. Are we together? God bless you. You can go back to your seats. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Amen. Time is not on our side, but I kindly request that we still give God his time. We have come to worship. May God bless us. Amen. Amen. This morning, our sermon title is in form of a question. Whose is the voice that you hear? Rhetoric, as it may be, 
it is a question that you and I, on an individual basis and collectively as a church, must answer today, here, and now. I therefore pray that as we shall go through the word of God this morning, that the Lord will help us to hear his voice when he speaks. I pray that God will bless us with receptive hearts and understanding minds so that we may hear and know and understand his will. And then ultimately, I pray that God will help us to live according to the dictates and impulses of his spirit. Having said thus, shall we bow our heads as we pray. Gracious Father in heaven, once again we are before your presence. We are at your disposal. Have thine own way in us and through us. And when all has been said and done, give us the power to live according to your will. And may you seal us unto the day of salvation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Turn with me, beloved, to the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. You can read it from your own Bibles. In the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 1, we meet with a woman called Hannah. Hannah is married to Elkanah, not as the only wife, according to the biblical principle, but as an additional woman into the life of another woman's man. In simpler terms, she is in marriage as wife number two. Now, Elkanah was no other than a man else we could excuse him. Elkanah was a worshiper of God, just like you and me today. Now, what puzzles me the most in life is how we, the professed Christian, us who claim to know God and his will, us who always gather for to worship, what puzzles me the most is that in life and in practice, we are always found on the other side of the fence. Guilty of the very things that God expressly forbids us from doing. Elkanah was a worshiper of God, and yet he had polygamy. Something that even non-Christians who have no fear of God, nor any God for his will, are afraid of. You will still find Christians who engage in polygamous marriages, and they are ready to open the scriptures in defense of the practice. As if God has left it to mankind to decide how many wives you should marry. Perhaps for the benefit of some amongst us who may not know the biblical principle of marriage, let us delve a little on the principles of marriage as they are embodied in God's word. And hear what the word of God says, the principles that govern, the principles that guide and the principles that define this divine institution. Turn with me to the book of Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 28. And God said, let us make men in our own image, after our own likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and everything that creepeth upon the ground. Verse 27. And God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. 
male and female created he them. And God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and have dominion over it. And have dominion over the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, and everything that creepeth upon the ground. I hope the saints are following. According to this passage, we see three principles about marriage. Principle number one, marriage is between humanity. Principle number two, marriage is between members of the opposite sex, male and females, males and females. Principle number three, Marriage is between one man and one wife. I will follow in saying, perhaps it's not yet clear. Turn your Bibles with me to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. When you read from Genesis chapter 2, verse 7 says, And God formed man out of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils, the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And then God took the man that he had created, and he put him in Eden. For God had planted a garden eastwards of Eden, and there he put the man that he had created to dress it and to keep it. And God brought the animals that he had created to Adam, so that Adam could name them. And whatsoever name that God and that Adam gave to the animals, that is their name to this very day. And then God said, It is not good for men to be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. If you are following church, God put Adam in the Garden of Eden, and Adam was alone. Then God said, It is not good for a man to be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. If you are following, God did not say, I will make for him helpers. He said, I will make him and help that is meet for him. So for a man, one wife is enough. According to the principles of marriage, as embodied in God's way. Read with me from verse 21. Verse 21. Anyone with the Bible? Verse 21. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he slept. And he slept, yes. And he took one of his ribs and closed. And he took one of his ribs and closed the flesh thereof, yes. yes. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man. This is where I want us to focus, Church of God. God takes one rib from Adam, and with that rib which he had taken from man, he formed or he made a woman. Yes. He did not make women. He made a woman. For a man, God created a woman. Yes. You can go down. Yes. Made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And God brought the woman unto Adam. Yes. And Adam said, this is now born of God. Upon waking up, and Adam is looking at this being before him, Adam exclaims, this is flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone. She shall be called woman, for she was taken from man. Yes. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother. And shall cleave unto his wife. And shall cleave unto his wife not wives. He shall leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife. Yes. And they shall be one flesh. And they, the two, shall become one flesh. The last verse. And they were both naked, and the man and his wife were not ashamed. Yes. Yes, the last verse. That's the last verse. Okay. I wanted the one that says, Therefore, what God has joined together, 
let no men put asunder. The principle of marriage, beloved, is that marriage is between humanity. When we come to human beings, marriage is between a man and a woman. And marriage is between one man and one woman. Anything outside that is a human invention. It is not of God. And may I hasten to say, anything that is not of God is of Satan. The principle of marriage, one man, one wife. Now, with the testimony of God so clear and pointed, how is it that the worshiper of God, Elkanah, had two women in his one life simultaneously competing for his love and his attention? Men beyond the love of the skirt, if left unguarded, is what brings even the strongest of men both physically and spiritually, to ruin. The principle of marriage, one husband and one wife. Are we following saints? So, take a closer look at your relationship. Take a closer look at your marriage relationship. Who are you with in that marriage? And how many people are you in that marriage? The question is not culture permitting. The question is not the laws of the land permitting. The question is, when you decide to have the kind of relationship that you have in matters of marriage, and when you decide to have the kind of person in your marriage whom you are having, and the number of people that you have in your marriage, the question is, whose voice are you hearing? Whose is the voice that you hear? I know men love multiple women. Matter of fact, womanizing is a sport. A little bit of Susan, a little bit of Rita, a little bit of Jennifer. It makes men feel manly. Men love multiple women. But I wish to, to, to highlight that no man can love more than one woman the same. You will prefer one, and the rest will be statistics in your life. I wish to remind us, church, that there is nothing that hurts a woman than seeing her own husband, the man that was once hers alone, embracing the bosom of another woman. There is nothing that hurts a woman than being treated by the one that she loves as if she was blessed before and has now passed the expiry date. It hurts a woman to the bone. And women cry before God day and night because of this kind of practice. And I wish to listen and say, God takes note of those tears. Because this idea of having multiple women against one, one man, the Bible calls it trifling with the heart. And trifling with the heart is a sin of no less magnitude as is murder. It will stand against us in the day of judgment. You might think that I'm threatening you. Turn with me to Malachi. Malachi chapter 2. Let us consider from verse 18. Malachi chapter 2. From verse 18. Another thing you do. You flood the Lord's altar with tears. You weep. I highlighted that God takes note of the tears of a woman when she cries because of her name, especially because of your love for multiple women. The Bible is saying here, 
And this have you done again. That's Malachi chapter 2, verse 18 to 17. You can check from your own Bible. Covering the altar of the Lord with tears and with weeping and with crying out, in so much that he regards not the offering anymore or receives it with goodwill at your hand. Yet you say, wherefore, this is the reason, because the Lord was witness between thee and the wife of your youth, against whom thou hast dealt treacherously, yet she is thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. And did he not make one? Yet he had the residue of the Spirit. And why one? That he might seek a godly seed. Therefore take heed to your spirit, and let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. Men and brethren, the idea of having multiple women is foreign to God. The idea of being in a marriage when you are members of the same sex is foreign to God. The idea of hum human beings getting married to animals is a human invention. All these things are not of God. And anything that is not of God is of Satan. The principle of marriage, one husband, one wife. And that is between a man and a woman. Now, having said that, you will still find men and women who will quote for you David, Samson, uh, David, Solomon, um, Jacob, and the like, in defense of their love for multiple women. And their argument is women are few. After all, the Bible has never said plainly that thou shalt not have more than one wife. Oh yes, it says. The question is, how readest thou? And when you choose to have multiple women in your own life, and when you choose someone who is not of the opposite sex to be in your life, the question is, whose is the voice that you hear? Follow me across the church. Hannah was a second wife. And do you know that in any marriage, if a man has more than one wife, the latest wife is always the favorite. That is a clear indication that no man can love two, two women and above the, at the same time, the same way. It's impossible. You will prefer one and then the rest will be just statistics in your life. Hannah was loved. When you read in the Bible, it was no different with Elkanah. He loved Hannah more than he loved Penina. You can find that in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. But even though she was the favorite, she was barren. So Hannah prayed, and every year they would go to the yearly sacrifice. And she would earnestly plead with God for a child. This happened over a very long period of time. And she did not receive the child. But she kept on praying. On one of um, the yearly prayers, she continued to pour out her heart unto God. And the priest Eli noticed her. Her lips were moving, but no voice was coming out. And he thought she was drunk. And he kind of um, uh, reprimanded her. And she says, no, my Lord, I am not drunk. I am pouring my heart out unto the Lord. And uh, the priest Eli said, the Lord grants you your request. And shortly afterwards, she conceived. Because she had requested on that particular occasion to the Lord and said, um, that is 1 Samuel chapter 1, uh, verse 10 and 11. She said, And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thy handmaid, and remember me and forget not thy handmaid, 
but will give unto thy handmaid a man child, then will I give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. So she finally conceived and bare a son, and she named him Samuel, saying, Because I have asked him of the Lord. And when Samuel was weaned of the mill, Hannah took him to the temple. Remember, saints, Hannah did not pray for a day. She prayed for years. She prayed without losing hope until God granted her request. I wish to say to the church today, God is still God. And he still hears the prayers of his children. And he still answers prayers today as he did before. But we must learn something. Prayer is not giving God much importance. We must learn to pray without ceasing. We must learn to pray patiently without losing heart. We must learn to wait upon the Lord without memory. Trust him fully that in his own time and in his own way, if it is, if it is in his will, he will surely grant us our petitions. The Lord answered her because she persisted in prayer. Mm. Many a times we do not have, number one, because we do not ask. And therefore we do not have. But God is willing to give. The other times we pray, but we ask amiss. And therefore God does not give us because we ask for the wrong reasons. But the other reason why we do not have in life it is because even when we ask, we are always tempted to let go the hand of the Lord too soon. As God's children, we must learn to persist in prayer. We must pray until something happens. We must wait upon the Lord, patiently waiting without murmuring. When it is in God's will, in his own time, he will answer us because God still answers prayers. But the part that I like most is after God had answered Hannah's prayer, she fulfilled her vow. She took the child Samuel to the temple. Someone opened for me First Samuel chapter 1, verse 24 to 28. Let us quickly go through it. First Samuel chapter 1, verse 24. As she comes to the temple, she comes to the priest Eli, the one who saw her praying and thought she was drunk. What did she say? First Samuel chapter 1, verse 24 to 28. And when she had made him, she took him up with her, the three bullocks and one ephah, ephah of flour and a bottle of wine. Yes. She brought him unto the house of the Lord in Shiloh. In Shiloh, yes. And the child was young. And the child was young, yes. And they slew a bullock and brought the child to Eli. Yes. And she said, Oh my Lord. And this is the part that I like most. And she said, Oh my Lord, yes. As thy soul liveth. As thy soul liveth. My Lord, I am the woman that stood. My Lord, I am that woman who stood, yes. I am that woman that stood by thee here, praying unto the Lord. I am that woman who stood by thee, praying unto the Lord, yes. For this child I pray. For this child I pray. And the Lord hath given me my petition. And the Lord hath given me my petition. Give me my petition, my yes. petition which I ask of him. Which I did ask of him, yes. Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord. Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he liveth. As long as he liveth. He shall be led to the Lord. He shall be led to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there. And he worshiped the Lord there. How I wish, beloved, if God could take us back through memory lane, memory lane and remind us of the vows that we made to him, especially at baptism or at some point in time in our lives. And how I pray that the Lord should remind us to pay our vows to the Lord. We vowed to keep the Sabbath holy. How many of us are keeping the Sabbath holy? We vowed to keep this body temple 
pure and clean and defiled. How many of us are taking good care of the temple of God, which is our body? May God take us through memory lane and let us reflect on each and every vow that we vowed unto the Lord. And may God help us this day to pay every one of them. But where I like most is where we are now going. So Samuel lived in the temple with the priest Eli as his mentor and guardian. Then we come to our memory verse, First Samuel chapter 3, verse 10. And it came to pass that the Lord began to speak with Samuel. I'm on chapter 3 now, First Samuel chapter 3. You can begin it from verse 1. The Lord began to speak with Samuel. And Samuel, not yet knowing the voice of the Lord, because the Lord of the word of the Lord was not yet revealed unto him, he mistook the voice of God for the voice of the priest Eli. And he answered, Here I am. And Samuel arose and ran to the priest Eli and said, My father, thou hast called me. The priest Eli, unaware that the Lord had begun to speak with Samuel, thought Samuel must have been having a dream. And he said unto Samuel, My son, I did not call thee. Go down and lie again. So Samuel went back to his bed, and he lay on his bed. Then the word of the Lord came the second time to Samuel. And Samuel, still unfamiliar with the voice of God, mistook the voice of God for the voice of the priest Eli. And he answered, Here I am. And he arose again the second time, and he went back to the priest Eli, and said, My father, Surely thou hast called me. Then it dawned upon the priest Eli that God had begun to speak with his servant. I know you cannot imagine the joy that filled Eli's heart upon learning that God had begun to speak with Samuel. Remember the priest Eli had his two sons, Hophni and Phineas. And on his two sons, he had done a terrible job. His sons were bad news. They went after filthy lacquer. They judged unrighteously. And they were even committing adultery with women in the temple. And Eli could not even control them. But upon learning that God had begun to speak with Samuel, Eli's heart bubbled with joy. Because he knew that at least amongst the Israelites, there is one who will hear the voice of God. And there is now one through whom his will will be communicated to his people. And so Eli said to Samuel, My son, I did not call thee. Go, lie down again. And when you hear the voice the third time, simply answer, Speak, Lord. Thy servant here. So Samuel went back and lay on his bed. And the word of the and the Lord came and stood and called unto Samuel. That is verse 10. Samuel, Samuel. And he answered. This time Samuel is familiar with the voice of God. He knows who is speaking to him. He knows who is calling out to him. And he simply answers. Speak, Lord, thy servant is listening. Mm. Saints of God, in our discourse today, I wish to remind us that God still speaks. From creation to this very hour, there is never a time in the history of this world that God has gone silent. From the time of Adam to this day, our day, God still speaks. But the tragedy with humanity is that we can no longer discern the voice of God. When God was calling out to Samuel, Samuel thought that it was the priest Eli that was calling his name. 
God is speaking, Samuel is going to a different person. In the world that we live today, church, there are so many voices that are calling for your attention and my attention. At the same time that these voices are calling out, God is calling out to you and to me. The question at the end of the day is, amidst all these voices that are calling out, whose is the voice that you hear? Whose is the voice that you hear? Let me just highlight some voices that are making too much noise in the world today. And that have made the voice of God to be so insignificant in the lives of God's children. Voice number one, it is the voice of fashion. Allow me to remind us that God has invested mankind with wisdom. Wisdom to design even the things that are best suited for our help. Unfortunately, when God is doing his thing, Satan also comes with a counterfeit to advance his own interest. I joined this church in 1988. I know some of you have been, uh, were in this church much longer than me. But when I joined this church, the distinction between the church and the world, the difference between the church and the world was very distinct. One of the things that we were known for as Adventists was dressing. Especially on the part of our women, it was easy to tell an Adventist woman in a street or in a marketplace. Because our women were dressing according to the principles of God's way. Simplicity and modesty characterized our women. But in today's world, the difference is minimal. You can hardly tell. The voice of fashion is falling out. And it is now louder than the principles of God's way. Fashion has become one of the most controversial topics within Adventism. You know, Adventists were known to be the people of the book. If something was in the word of God, we accepted it, we taught it, and tried as much as we could to live by it. Today, the word of God is debatable. Everyone presents his own viewpoint. And therefore, the difference is no longer existing between the world and the church when it comes to dress code. Let me quote uh, from uh, the pen of inspiration. The first quote comes from um, Testimonies for the Church, volume 4, page 647 to 648. God said, made rights, obedience to fashion, to fashion is pervading our Seventh-day Adventist churches and is doing more than any power to separate our people from God. There is a terrible sin upon us as people that we have permitted our church members to dress in a manner inconsistent with the faith. We must rise at once and close the door against the allurements of fashion. Unless we do this, our churches will become demoralized. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 4, page 647 to 648. The reality of the Church, beloved, is that in dress and deportment, Christian women are not heeding the word of God. Instead, Hollywood, San Francisco, France, and Italy are leading the way. Another quote. Child Guidance, 429, paragraph 1. Our dress should not scream sex or pride or money. Rather, it should whisper humility, purity, and moderation. If we dress in this manner, the still small voice of our witness will be louder than the gospel of fashion. My brothers and sisters, I would encourage us to go and check our wardrobes. The world is saying one thing. The principle of God's way is saying another. The question at the end of the day is, whose is the voice that you hear? 
The second voice that is making a lot of noise is the voice of fame and fortune. The desire for the things of this life has separated many a heart from God. Men and women are preoccupied about what they shall eat, what they shall wear, where they will stay, what they will drive, and what they will leave for their future generations. While these things in and of themselves are not bad, these things have removed God from position number one. The only position from which God can save us. Look with me, church. When people choose careers, God is not consulted. Think of the music industry, the entertainment industry. Men and women are making it big in this world because of this industry. People desire riches at any cost. The pursuit of dreams is separating men and women from God. People desire riches at any cost. Even the professed Christians are being separated from God because we are chasing after the things of this life. Turn with me to the book of 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6 to 12. Let us quickly read. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Read for us from verse 6 to verse 12. But godliness with contentment is great gain. It is great gain. The Bible says godliness with contentment is great gain. Yes. For we brought nothing, For we brought nothing into this world. Yes. And it, is certain we carry and it is certain that we will carry nothing out of this world. And having food and raiment. And having food and raiment. Let us be. Let us be content, yes. But they that will be rich, but they that will to be rich fall into diverse temptations, yes. And a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts. Yes. Which drown man in destruction and perdition. In destruction and perdition, yes. For the love of money is the For the love of money is the root of all evil. Which while some coveted. Which while some coveted after. Yes. They have erred from the faith. They have erred from the faith. And pierced themselves through. And pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Yes. But thou, O man of God. But thou, O man of God. Flee these things. Flee these things. And follow after righteousness. And follow after righteousness. Godliness. Godliness. Faith. Faith. Love. Love. Patience. Patience. And meekness. And meekness. Fight the good fight. Of fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold. And lay hold on eternal life. Where unto thou art also called. Where unto thou art also art called. Yes. And has professed a good. And has professed a good profession before many witnesses. You may end there. Matthew chapter six. When you go to Matthew chapter six, God knows that we need the things of this world, and it is not a sin to desire the things of this world. But one thing that is most important is that the word of God says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Whether God will add them, it is at his discretion. Whether God will not add them, it is at his discretion. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. The love of fame and fortune has separated many a heart from the Savior. The last thing, the other voice that is separating, that is making a lot of noise in the world today, is the voice of human rights. The voice of human rights is separating men and women from God. There is nothing that is called the right if it is not embodied in God's way. If it is a human invention and goes contrary to the teachings of God's word, to the plainest teachings of scripture, it is not a right. But in today's world, men and women are transgressing the laws of God in defense of what are called human rights on this world. If you were to read from a uh, 
We read earlier on from Genesis chapter 2. And we saw the principle of marriage. According to the principle of marriage, marriage is between human beings. Marriage is between a male and a female. Marriage is between one man and one wife. In my country where I come from, the, marriage, the, 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 the bride price, the bride price is no longer a requirement. Meaning to say, if our children consent, they can start living together. As long as they love each other, they can start living together. And men are allowed by law to have mistresses, even if they are married. This is what the laws of the land are saying. But what does God say? Hebrews chapter 13 verse 4. Marriage is honorable unto God, and the bed undefiled. But warmongers and adulterers, God shall judge. Men and brethren, if you are a man and you have a woman and you are not yet married, the Bible teaches abstinence before marriage and faithfulness to one partner in marriage. The world is saying another thing. The question at the end of the day is, whose is the voice that you hear? In matters of marriage, people have invented other marriages. According to the Bible, marriage is between a man and a woman. Today, members of the same sex are getting married. They be men, they be women. Today, people are changing themselves from one gender to the other, and it's called the right. In our world today, men and women are getting married to animals. They call it speciality, and it is a right according to the laws of the land. But what does the word of God say? Read with me, Leviticus chapter 18, verse 23. Neither shalt thou lie with any beast to defile thyself therewith. Neither shall any woman stand before a beast to lie down there to eat his confusion. Leviticus 20, verse 15. If any man lie with a beast, he shall surely be put to death, and you shall slay the beast. Are you following church? Mm. Governments are enacting laws, and those laws are taken as rights by human beings. But those laws are contradicting the plainest teachings of scripture. The question is not what the law of the land says. The question is whose voice are you hearing when you decide to marry a person of the same sex with you? when you decide to marry as many women as you can, when you decide to get married to an animal, it is not about what the laws of the land say. It's about what God says. The question is, between the voice of the state and the voice of God, whose is the voice that you hear? Hmm. In conclusion, John 10, verse 27. John 10, Verse 27, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Church of God, I want to ask as I close. Have you read the message? Yes. Amen. Did you understand the message? Amen. I want to ask myself and the church at large. Do we still have people like some in our midst? Men and women who, when God speaks, they will say, speak, Lord, thy servant is listening. Do we still have men and women, even in the Adventist church, amongst us who are still here today, like Eli, who still get goosebumps upon hearing the voice of God in their lives? Do we still have men and women like Elijah, who stand for the truth, Though the heavens may fall. Men and women who can still call sin by its right name. Men and women who are as true to duty as is the needle to the poor. Men who will stand for the truth, though the heavens fall. Do we still have such kind of people? This morning, there are so many voices in the world. 
that are calling for my attention. And yet God still speaks. It is my heart's desire that whenever God speaks, I will hear his voice. I will understand what he says and then do whatsoever he says until he comes, whatever the cost. If it is your desire, stand and pray together with me. Our eyes are closed. Gracious Father in heaven, we are before your presence this Sabbath. What a privilege that it, it is for us that we can still hear you speaking without any persecution or coaxation. We have never gone silent. Ever since you created the world, you have spoken your will to your sons and daughters and you still speak. We are living in a world that is confused because there are so many voices that are calling for our attention. And said to say, even us the professed Christians are heeding other voices at the expense of listening to your voice. This moment, having learned from the few examples that we went through, we kindly ask that you help us to take an inventory of our own spiritual lives and check ourselves at the things that we do, the things that we love, the things that we push, the things that we defend, and the things that we practice. Help us, O Lord, to check ourselves if we be still in the faith. It is our heart's desire 